Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that you are in this place, Lord. Hmm. Moving in this place, Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you will pour yourself out, pour yourself out, Lord, today in this place. <clears throat> Fill my head, Lord, with your thoughts and my heart, with your intentions, Jesus. During all circumstances in life, if we just really learn how to wait for you, things will go so much better and well. <laughs> because you have such great care and love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And that is what I'm going to talk about today, his great passion for us. <clears throat> One could actually say that there is a layer in the Bible that just contains his passion for us, that the whole Bible is about his passion for us, even in the Old Testament. <clears throat> if we look thoroughly into Scripture, we will see this fact. So I'm taking a story out <clears throat> of how Jesus is restoring the life of Peter in a different way, that we don't understand the way that Jesus restores our life. He does it in such a way that, that is so refined, and, and yet we go through things when we, um, when we don't understand him, when we do our own things. And this I'm going to dig into. And then summarized with his great passion and love for us all through pictured all through peter's life <clears throat> i'm just going to read a story here because this is a previous story to the main story that i have for you today this is in luke 22 and this is verse 56. the religious leaders sized jesus and led him away but peter followed from a distance, from a safe distance, <laughs> safe distance. Sometimes we want to be in a safe place because we don't understand what's really going on, right? So we don't step out into things. And Jesus had, at, at this point, Jesus had told Peter that he would deny him. But Peter boastfully said, no, Lord, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, Jesus, right? Remember that? No, and Peter was answering like, no, that, that's not, not even being an option, am I right? When you read it, it's like it never occurred to Peter that he would actually reject Jesus. But it proves how frail and fickle the carnal is. They brought him to the home of the high priest where people were already gathered out in the courtyard. Someone had built a fire so Peter inched closer and sat down among them to stay warm. He's in his comfort zone, right? Being surrounded by people, not believing Jesus. So he's actually stepping back. We already see it here, right? He's backsliding into his carnal, cozy fireplace. You know that place inside, right? Where it's just... You and the old comfort of the old life in some way, right? We all know this. A girl noticed Peter sitting in the firelight. Can you imagine Peter sitting there? He's just walked around with Jesus telling him, I will never leave you. And then they see Jesus being dragged away. And then he's kind of like hiding in a safe spot among the people. It's such a great picture that they build a fire, isn't it? It's such a great picture of comfort and warmth and something that you just want to give yourself into in the carnal. Staring at him, she pointed, at, she pointed him out and said, this man is one of Jesus' disciples. <laughs> Peter flatly denied it. I like this translation. Saying... What are you talking about, girl? I don't know him. Right? When we're so confronted in ourselves, when we don't feel Jesus in the situation, when we don't really lean in on Jesus in the situation, Peter is not leaning in on Jesus in the situation. He's leaning in on the surroundings. He's leaning in on what's going on around him, right? So this is what's happening with us. 
This applies for all of us when we leave Jesus on the inside. A little while later, someone else spotted Peter and said, I recognize you. You're one of his. I know it. The third time, the second time. But Peter again said, I'm not one of his disciples. Isn't it interesting that he's spotted in such a way that he needs to speak out? That he needs openly to deny Jesus and he's doing it openly. I think that's so interesting because when when we look at the life of Jesus and how he walked, Jesus always spoke and there was life, right? And now Peter is almost like he's pronouncing his own death, spiritual death, right? So what is it that we apply to with words, right? That's, that's so important to contemplate, to, to dive into. About an hour later, someone else identified Peter. So a whole hour he was sitting there <laughs> in his carnal, wonder what went through his mind. I denied Jesus two times. Jesus told me when the rooster crows, I will deny him the third time. He must have thought of that. He must, that must have gone through his mind. And while he was thinking all that, he saw Jesus in the distance with the high priest, hand, handcuffed, carried away probably like that, right? Someone else identified Peter and insisted he was a disciple of Jesus, saying, look at him, he is from Galilee, just like Jesus. I know he's one of them. It's such a great picture because the the Bible talks about that we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. And the third one is really identifying Peter being one of Jesus' disciples in such a way that you can't miss it, right? (laughs) But Peter was adamant, listen, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't you understand? I I don't even know him. I don't even know him. And while the words were still in his mouth, the rooster crowed. Jesus is so spot on in his prophetic ways, isn't he? You don't miss out on anything with Jesus, right? At that moment, the Lord was being led through the courtyard by his captors, turned around and gazed at Peter. Can you imagine that? (laughs) All at once, Peter remembered the word Jesus had prophesied over him. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny uh, three times that you even know me. Peter burst into uh, tears, ran off from the crowd, and wept bitterly. Right? Oh, you can just feel that one, can't you? I can just feel that one. That rejection of Jesus, the, the just reject Jesus in a way and he knew that he was Jesus had spoken it to him. So everything that Jesus says to you is, is the life. It will come to pass, right? So let's look at how Jesus is going to restore him. This is, this is in the book of John. And, and John is the one, I want you to remember, that John is the one telling this story about Peter. It's John writing, not Peter. We don't hear Peter talking about the story any place or any time. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, John 21, verse 1. Later, Jesus appeared once again to a group of his disciples by Lake Galilee. So Jesus now has been now been resurrected. This is uh, the once again, he's appearing here. Uh, before his disciples. So Jesus is now coming back into their lives to, to show that what he said is the truth. Not to prove it, because Jesus don't need to prove anything, but to show that he is the truth. And what he says will come to pass. 
Mm. It's us that needs to gear our mind in the right direction, not to interpret what Jesus is saying, but to understand who he is. Yesterday I saw a glimpse of a movie and it was about this man and he was married to this woman and he loved her so much and she became pregnant and she died in a car accident right before his eyes. So he made up this story of how she died in a totally different way that it was his fault because he could not cope with the reality of how she died. That's the carnal. The mind will twist us. So we need to understand. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So we need to understand the ways of Jesus and we need to understand Jesus. Otherwise, we will start to interpret what it is that he's saying, right? And we will miss the reality that he's placing before us. It happened one day while Peter, Thomas, the twin, Nathalia from Cana and Galilee, Jacob, John, and two others' disciples were all together. Peter told him, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to my old life. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand this. Have you ever been in a life last time? And you just had this glorious experience with Jesus Christ. And then one week later, you're almost off in your own life, right? You want to leave, you want to check out. I'm just going to go back doing my old works, right? I'm going fishing, and they all replied, we'll go with you. <laughs> we'll go with you. So they went off and fished through the night, and but caught nothing. <laughs> Again. That's the same story as in the beginning, when Jesus meets them. It's the same story, it's the same happening. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. I just love to contemplate those things. Why God is doing it like that? Mm -hmm. And we think we understand God. That is so pathetic. Anyway, but they caught nothing. So imagine this. Jesus is no longer here. He's risen, but we haven't seen anything of what he's talking about, really. You know, I don't understand. So let's go fishing. Let's do the old thing, right? That's the nature of the carnal. That's the response to the situation through the carnal. I'm just going to go in my repetitive mode of the things that I know, which is of comfort to me, right? That's the nature of the carnal, right? Mm -hmm. Then at dawn, Jesus was standing there on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was him. He called out to them saying, hey guys, did you catch any fish? <laughs> No. <laughs> not a thing, they replied. No, not a, not a thing. Just shouting out to the shore. Jesus shouted to them, throw your net over the starboard side and you'll catch some. You would think they'd be like, that's got to be Jesus. But no, that's not what's happening. It's the same story repeated here again. So they did as he said, and they caught so many fish, they couldn't even pull in the net. This is such an interesting part. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John. And this is the way John is describing himself. Right? That means... When we meet Jesus, we will start to act and behave differently. We will become a new person. That is such a weird way he's describing himself, isn't it? Then you'll be writing, then the disciples whom Jesus loved, that's me. That's such a weird way of describing yourself, right? That's us. So we're going to change in our behavior and the way we describe things and the way that we see things. I just love that. Isn't that beautiful? Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, Peter hadn't recognized him because he's saying this to Peter. So John was the first to recognize Jesus. That was John, the disciple Jesus loved. He was very close to Jesus. Jesus had three disciples that were close. But the first one here recognizing Jesus was John. It's the Lord. When Peter heard him say that, Please pay attention to all the words spoken here. Mm -hmm. 
right? Life came, right? Life came to Peter. Boom. He realized that's the Lord. Do you think it was by seeing? No, 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 no. It was a recognition of the Spirit. Something happened within him, right? Because otherwise he would have recognized Jesus beforehand it was, if it was by sight. Do you understand what I'm talking about? All those little details we have to pay attention to in our lives. <clears throat> when Peter heard him say that, he quickly wrapped his outer garment around him and became, and, uh, and because he was athletic. In the Greek, it says he was naked. It's like, well, that don't add up. But in the Aramaic, it says he was, he was athletic. So he took his clothes and he wrapped it up himself around him. Sometimes you got to be ready for Jesus. You can't have your garment flipping around, things in the way when you got to go to Jesus. So you got to get it out of the way, wrap it around yourself. And then he dived into the water. He jumped into the water. He ran to Jesus, right? I just love these pictures. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> he, he dove right into the lake to go to Jesus right into the water. He was so hungry when he, when this spirit was, when his spirit was convicted of that it was Jesus, when he knew that when he felt Jesus from a distance, when John spoke the word, something happened in Peter and this longing for Jesus made him just jump off board as the only one. That's hunger for Jesus. The other disciples then brought the boat to shore, dragging their catch of fish. They weren't far from land, only about a hundred meters. So Peter, Peter must have swimmed, right? Wonder what happened when Peter came up before the others. I like to contemplate that. Standing there, it's you, Lord. What would you say, right? That he'd just been out all night fishing. He's just been out all night doing his old life. And then the Lord showed up in a, such a magnificent way. And he got so hungry in his spirit. And he went off and he swam the shore. And he was standing there. And Jesus was preparing for food. So he might have gone over there and just to sit next to him. Just him and Jesus. Right? Isn't that beautiful? I like to contemplate that. Doesn't say anything about if they were talking. I don't think they were. I think Peter was somehow stunned, just amazed that the Lord was there, right? So in our hardest times, when we don't feel Jesus, when we don't see him in the circumstances and we're off to the old life, suddenly Jesus is there. The question is, do you really know that he will show up? He will. He will show up in the hardest times of circumstances. He will show up. <laughs> we just have to wait. This was the right moment. Jesus knew that this was the right moment. We don't know when the right moment is. Jesus knows when the right moment is. Have you noticed that there is a rhythm that when you pray for something to get rid of something, that you go through the hardship of it first? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. That there is this inner ripping apart? Wonder how discouraged Peter must have felt, so discouraged that he went off fishing. And Jesus had told the disciples, now go into all of the world and preach the gospel. Peter had at this point seen so many signs, wonders, and miracles that we can't believe it. Mm -hmm. And yet he went back to his old life. This also proves the point that in the old life when we go back, we need Jesus to pull us out. Mm -hmm. We need Jesus to come to the shore, to the lake of the shore, and to call at us when we are in the ocean, on our ship, <laughs> doing our old life, right? 
And we need Jesus to, hey, it's over here. You're, you, that's not the place I've called you to be. Right? And you'll be like, but the, the question is, do you recognize Jesus in that moment? Do you know it's him? Sometimes we can be so far off from the shore. Right? In our own life. That is the question. Nonetheless, Jesus shows up. Nonetheless, Jesus will haul you in, right? <laughs> and when they got to the shore, they noticed a charcoal fire with some roasted fish and bread. So all the disciples now coming in. <laughs> then Jesus said, bring some of the fish you just caught. I don't think they spoke anything. I don't think they said anything. I, th I just think that they were, they were just in some amazement that Jesus was there. So Peter waded into the water and helped uh, pull the net to shore. It was full of many large fish, exactly 153. But even with so many fish, the net was not torn. <laughs> so what Jesus gives us of super abundantly provision, it won't break, it won't fall away. Jesus is not going to give you something that's going to fall away. Sometimes it's too good for the carnal. Is it really? Is that really for me, Lord? Yes, that's really for you. Will I lose it? Maybe it's just for, maybe it's just, I can just use a few fish, you know. Because they were fishermen, so they were living of it. That means, Lord, I just need a few fish to pay my bills, right? I just need a little money, Lord. But you're giving me all this? Is that really all for me, Lord? Yes, it's all for you. And the net won't break. You won't lose what he's giving you. It's a picture of that. Come, let's have some breakfast, Jesus said to them. I wonder what they look like. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sit down. Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> and not one of the disciples needed to ask who it was. Because every one of them knew it was the Lord. This is beautifully written. Then Jesus came close to them, right, and served them bread and fish. Isn't that beautiful? That's his primary trait, serving. He's now serving again after his resurrection, serving the disciples, serving the people. <laughs> This was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. So they're sitting there eating breakfast. I don't think they spoke anything. I, I just think that they were in the presence of the Lord eating. Isn't that a great picture? Mm -hmm. Having communion with the Lord. That's a picture of that, right? You just went off in your old life on the boat, and then Jesus hauls you in. And when he hauls you in, there is communion. There is sacramenta, right? Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, beautiful spiritual picture of what's really going on. When we're out in the old life, Jesus will come and haul us in. After they had breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you burn with love for me than these? Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know I have great affection for you. Then take care of my lambs. Now Jesus is starting to call him in on his calling in his ministry. Mm -hmm. Jesus is now pulling him in through the words, through the occurrence. I just think it's so beautiful. Remember that he denied three times, uh, Jesus three times? So this is the first time. 
Then Jesus repeated his question the second time. Simon, son of Jonah, do you burn with love for me? Peter answered, yes, my Lord, you know that I have great affection for you. Wonder what, people thought, wonder what Peter thought here. Why is he calling you son of Jonah and why is he asking me this twice? He just asked me the question and I just answer him. I, I don't understand this, Lord. That's right. We don't understand the ways of the Lord. That is absolutely correct. Now, the question is, will you just answer Jesus what he's asking of you? Peter is. Peter must have had some thoughts to this. Right? He must have thought, why is he asking me this? This is the second time. He just asked me the question. He's not an old man. He can hear very well. Right? All these thoughts must have gone through his head. Why is he doing that? I don't understand, Lord. That's right. That's right. You don't understand. That's his great passion. We don't understand his great passion. But, and then in this, Jesus is like saying to him, will you, I, don't, I know you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but in that, will you help me restore your life? Will you just answer the question that I'm asking you? I know you don't understand, but will you answer my question? It's very simple with Jesus, right? It's very plain and simple. I'm asking you a question, and you will answer, mm -hmm. right? Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Then Jesus asked him again, Peter, son of Jonah, do you have great affection for me? And then Peter was hurt. Sometimes we have to go through some things with Jesus, <laughs> and we don't understand. It was like, I don't understand. And we're hurt. We're hurting. Peter was saddened by being asked the third time and said, my Lord, you know everything. Right? That's us. I don't understand this, Lord. I'm in this situation again, and you're in Ellen. I don't understand. I know you know everything. Why am I here again, Lord? Because we don't, usually it's because we don't understand the spiritual affair of what it is that Jesus is actually restoring. There is such much more the spiritual realm of Jesus Christ than there is in the physical realm of Jesus Christ. We wait too much, we put too much weight on the physical realm of Jesus Christ. Jesus is very occupied with the spiritual realm because he's occupied with what? The afterlife, right? That's spiritual, right? So Jesus is far more occupied with that than with us here, the physical realm. We think physical realm. We think, why is he doing, why is this happening again? We should, we should go into a prayer closet when we don't understand mm -hmm. and ask Jesus, what is going on in the spiritual realm in this affair? What is it that you're restoring in the spiritual realm? Mm -hmm. Amen. You know everything. You know that I burn with love for you. That's us. I don't understand this, Lord. You know I love you. <laughs> Why is this going on again? Why do you ask me this question? Why do you place me in this situation? And then there's another point. It's a small side rabbit, but I'm taking it out. Remember, it's John writing this. It's not Peter writing this. It's John. We have each our, our own calling. Peter is not talking. You don't can't find anywhere in Scripture that Peter is, is mentioning this. Nowhere. I find that so interesting. It's John describing this affair. Why do you think that Peter is not talking about it? Because he was hurt. Because he didn't really, he didn't really get Jesus, right? It's hard to talk about those things where we don't get Jesus, right? So he's not writing about this. I find that so interesting to contemplate. Jesus replied, then feed my lambs. Peter listened. Now he's using the name Peter. It's like back here now. 
Simon, son of Jonah, that was his name, before he met Jesus. And then he met Jesus, and Jesus gave him a new name, Peter, the rock. On you, I will build my church. Peter was the feisty one. He had temper. <laughs> John was more, oh, oh, Lord. He was more like that. And you can read that in Scripture. When we read about, when we read how Peter is writing, and then when we read about how John is writing, and how John is describing, he's all about love. Oh, Lord, the, the Bible loves you, and the love, and the love. So it's the love gospel, right? That's not Peter. Peter is full on fire, hands on, the first one in the water, the first one to take action. Such an apostle to the fingertips, just wanting to go out there and get it, you know. <laughs> Peter, listen, when you were younger, you made your own choices and you went where you pleased. But one day when you're old, others will tell you, uh, others will tie you up and escort you where you would not choose to go. And you will spread out your arms. Here Jesus is describing the death of Peter. How he's going to hang upside down on the cross with his arms to each side. Jesus said this to Peter as a prophecy of what kind of death he would die. For the glory of God. For the glory of God. That's the whole point of why Jesus is saying things. For the glory of God. That's the whole point of why Jesus is asking you a question. Because in that question, you might understand a bit more for the glory of God. So when you understand more of the glory of God here while being here on earth more glory of God will be spread out. That's the whole point, right? And then, of course, also in the afterlife. And then he said, Peter, follow me. <laughs> follow me. Jesus saying, do as I do. Do like me. Copy what I'm doing. Look carefully to what it is that I'm doing. That's follow, right? Remember when you were a kid, you played that game that one was leading and the other was walking behind, and then you had to do the same things as the one that was leading. Remember that game? That's the game of Jesus Christ. <laughs> right? <laughs> then Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This is still John writing this. Here we're going to see another uh, weakness in the carnal. This was, the, this was the disciple who sat close to Jesus at the Last Supper and had asked him, Lord, who is the one that will betray you? This is how John is describing himself. <laughs> He's not writing, I, John. He's writing the one. There is something about that the way he's, he's talking about himself that there is such an annihilation to his identity as a person. His identity as in the carnal. He's totally denying all the carnality. He's not, describing, he's not saying I. He's describing himself as the one who loves Jesus so much. Can you hear, not, who are you? I'm the one who loves Jesus so much. That's how he is describing himself. That is so beautiful, isn't it? I'm not, so if you ask me, who are you? I'm the, I'm the disciple who loves Jesus so much. I'm not going to say my name is Elena and so and so and I have this and this and this. I'm going to say, and then you would know what I'm full of, right? It's a, can you see that? I think that's so beautiful the way he's describing himself in many different ways. So when Peter saw him, he asked Jesus, what's going to happen to him? Peter is asking Jesus, what's going to happen to John? <laughs> the carnal is so occupied with everything else, isn't it? Oh, everybody else calling and what they're doing and why and why, why. 
always in comparison to itself, right? Jesus replied, if I decide to let him live until I return, which is actually more than 2,000 years, what concern is that of yours? He's rebuking Peter. Maybe that's why Peter's not really talking about this. Right? Maybe. I think it's so interesting that all the stories that there is in the book of uh, the Gospel of John are only in the Gospel of John. John took out different stories from Jesus, the life of Jesus Christ that you only find in here. What is that of yours? You must still keep on following me. None of your business. Mind your own track. Right? Why? Because that's where we're going to experience most of the love he has for us. Because that's where we're going to be closest to Jesus. Do you understand that? That's very, actually very important. So when we're occupied with others and their calling and why, and we maybe even want to be like them or do like that, yeah, that feels good in my car, no, I want to do that too, or whatever, we're losing some intimacy with Christ that is placed upon our lives that can only be poured out when we do the things that he's asking us to do in our own personal walk with him, right? So hands off with other people's lives. Let me just see. So the rumors started to circulate among the believers, among the believers, not among unbelievers or anybody else. No, 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 no. This is the believers. That this disciple, John, wasn't going to die. And you'll be like, no. <laughs> but Jesus never said that. He only said, I like that he's writing this, John. He only said, if I let him live until I return, what concern is that of yours? Isn't that such a great analogy of the carnal? Jesus saying he's going to live forever. Suddenly you have an elephant, you know, a mice that becomes an elephant. It always becomes something else than what Jesus is saying. That's the carnal. It's weak, it's fickle, you know. <laughs> That's why we have the Bible. So we can look into the Bible. <laughs> I just love that. The carnal makes up stories about what Jesus is saying. It interprets on its own. It's always about something else, Eve in the garden. No, the Lord said that we cannot, uh, that we, can, we cannot eat of these and we can't even touch it. The Lord did not say that. We can't make it without Jesus. There is always going to be some twist to it. It's always going to be distorted. You know, it's always going to be twisted, distorted, and, you know, and, and something that the Lord never said. That's the nature of the carnal. I just think it's so interesting and very, you could say in that spot on, that he is writing the last thing here. But Jesus never said that. We've got to pay close attention to what Jesus is saying. You know, Jesus can speak three words to us, and we can have all these stories about what it is. How many times have you ever had a dream from the Lord or the Lord speak to you about something and right away the carnal, blah, 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 it, it puts everything in boxes. Boom, 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 right? It's just like that. Why? Because that's where the carnal feels most comfort. Everything is boxed up, in control, I'm in control, check, mm. right? That's not the calling from the Lord. Just like with Peter. Here, Jesus is announcing the calling of Peter. This is how Jesus is announcing, you're going to go into ministry now. Jesus is not saying to him, now you're going to go into ministry. No, he's asking him, do you love me? What happens to a great minister of God 
He was so discouraged. I was just reminded of that. I'm just not going to say his name. But he was so discouraged, and he just wanted to pay the bills and just wanted to do things. What did the Lord ask him? The Lord asked him, do you want some money? And then he said, no, Lord. I want souls to be saved. You so you see, the Lord asks us questions to reflect what is our response, right? Where we're at, right? Sometimes the response is not correct the first time, the second time, or the third time. Just like with Peter, I don't understand. And he was saddened, you know. But the Lord will not give up. So he's asking him three times. Restoring the old life of the rooster crying three times. What do we really know when Jesus asks us or put, places us in situation repeatedly? What do we actually know what's really going on? Do you think it's for you? <laughs> no? Do you think it was for Peter that he asked him? No, it was the restoring of the old life so that he could walk into ministry. Was that for Peter? No. It was for saving souls, to spread the gospel. Right? We're so occupied, the carnal is so occupied with itself all the time. Have you noticed that? It just takes, you have five minutes with the Lord and you're all in the Lord and then after five minutes, you're in yourself. You're in yourself. Right? And you'll be like, wow, man, I'm here back in this place again. How's it ever? Yeah. Just proves to us how much we need Jesus, right? Yeah. It proves to us that that's the nature of the carnal. Yeah. It proves to us <laughs> that we can, in the carnal, perhaps stay in glory oh, for two minutes. And then, oh, even in worship, you know this. How many thoughts do you have in worship that does not concern Jesus? <laughs> I'm going to go home, and then I'm going to cook, and then I'm going to make that dinner. No, maybe I'm going to make that dinner. And then I'm going to do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord. Am I right? <laughs> it proves to us that we need Jesus. And we try really hard. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I was, my mind was wandering around. da 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 Oh, Lord, and, and, and then we stand for a minute in the glory with the Lord. And we, we experience him. We feel the presence of the Lord. And then suddenly the mind's off again into something else. Oh, it hurts in my back. Oh, yeah. I need to do some more exercise. Maybe I need to go to the gym tomorrow. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. There are many thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's the kernel. Mm -hmm. Accept it. It's, it's such a triggery with the carnal because there has to be this acceptance and yet we have to press in on his presence. That's spiritual. Yeah. That's spiritual business. And the minute that we, the mind starts to wander off, just let it go and then just very slowly move back. Isn't that beautiful how he set it up that we can do that? Mm -hmm. And we can do that without any condemnation upon ourselves. That's amazing. That's his love, right? Okay, let's see here. So his great passion for us is that we can't, we can't, you know this, we can't make it without him. We can't, in that place, we can't hardly even answer the, we can hardly even answer correctly. You see, at some point when we've been hurt so much 
that when Jesus asks us a question, the answer that comes out of us is the answer that he's looking for, but it comes from his spirit. It does not come from us. How foolish to think that he would transform the carnal into something of him. That's not the na nature of God. Do you understand these affairs? Let me explain a little bit. The affairs of God is that he will transform, that he will occupy us so much that it will only be him left. Mm -hmm. That the nature of the carnal no longer can be stewarded by the carnal's affairs and be stewarded by the will of its own, but it will only be stewarded by the will of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. There is no longer something that's clashing in that place within. There is no longer this back and forth within, now the Holy Spirit has taken so full of and in control that there is only the Holy Spirit left for Jesus to be poured out. After this, the Holy Spirit came on the disciples and then they went off into the world and preached the gospel. It's a constant reminder for us that we constantly need Jesus to go to. He is our constant go-to person. He should constantly be the number one person that we go to as the first one. Never make a phone call, never do anything unless you confide it in Jesus first. That's the only way that we can really come to be really close and intimate with him. And he will keep placing you in the same place until you get it. Because he loves you. <laughs> and in that place, we'll be like, why am I here again, Lord? And he's saying, because I love you. Because I want to be so close to you. Don't you understand that? No, we don't. We don't. So therefore, he's constantly wanting us to spend time with him so that we will be purged. Have you ever, you, you must have experienced this, just 10 minutes in his presence and you just know things are never going to be the same. How can you explain that? You can't. One minute in the anointing is worth 10 years, 100 years of working in our own, right? And yes, then we go off to life, out in life, and to life, we go to work, we do things, and then the carnal starts to grow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why we come, we gotta come in and drink, 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 drink. When we drink of God, when we drink of Jesus, the carnal diminishes. <laughs> there is a rhythm in these things. It's all spiritual. And then we go out in the world, and then we have to become a mother, and then we have to do this, and then we got to go in and drink and drink and drink. And you can do that while cooking. Mm. When you become really good at being in his presence, you can do that while cooking. Because now it, you've changed so much in his presence that you no longer just can go back just to be carnal. Do you, do you understand these things, right? You experience this, right? Mm. So more of him and less of us. Drink, 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 eat, 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 drink, drink, drink. That's what we do in worship. That should be the inner heart's position. Yes, we worship here at church for so and so in time, but that should be the inner heart's position of constant worship to the Lord. Right? So that he can pour himself out through us. So when he asks us a question, our response will align up with his spirit because it's his spirit being poured out. I think there's way too much emphasis on us doing some work. That's the Old Testament. Mm -mm. We, can't, we can't work in the spiritual. How many people do actually see the spiritual things? Most people don't. Most people don't experience anything spiritual. Not on a continuous basis as to know what's really going on, you know. 
But the more we spend time in his presence, the more we become spiritually aware of what's going on around us. Because his spirit, we are constantly inviting his spirit to walk through our lives, to be the vessel that he can pour himself out through. First, they have this, there has to be this cleaning up, but we still need to constantly go to him. We should never be, become so sure that we think that we got it. The minute that we think that we lost it, that's a for sure thing. So in the spiritual realm, there is this order, and yet it's not in boxes. We can never box the spiritual. Because what I'm saying to you right now holds some contradictions. That's on purpose. <laughs> because if I said it's just like that, then your carnal would be like, that's it, I got it. <laughs> and you're taking many notes, and you're, yes, I got it. <laughs> right? That's the nature of the carnal. We have to figure out that the spiritual, that his spirit is alive. What is alive? If you look at a plant and it's alive, it's not, it does not look the same as it did yesterday. Something grew. Something changed, right? That's God. And we think that's a plant, that's it. How stupid is that? <laughs> right? No. We're going to look at it and then we're going to see it's changing. It's molding. Wow, there's a flower coming there. Right? All of this because that's his great love for us. I think one of the things with Jesus' love for us is that we can never figure him out. Yeah, but you just said last week that you can know God. How does that? I don't understand, Lena. That's true. I'm going to keep holding on to my contradictions because that's the truth of it. Because in that place, you will stay awake. You see, if I preached and you were not thinking, I failed. Mm -hmm. My job here is to make you think. Mm -hmm. If you just had one thought, then I've done my job. What does he mean? Then I've done my job. But if I preached and you just thought, this is not nice, comfort, something, you know, I can just sit here and sleep a bit, you know, then I failed. Because that's the spirit of Jesus. Jesus makes us think, doesn't he? He makes us wonder. He makes us, why am I going through this again? And he makes us wonder in his glory. Oh, oh even in that he makes us think. Am I right? When I'm in his glory, I'd be like, oh, oh. You know? I'd be like that. And I wonder. And I see things. I experience things. And I wonder. When I'm in pain, I wonder. He wants me to think, right? So I wonder about the glorious things and I wonder about the horrible things. If there is a good God, then why is there, you know, all these questions, right? And what happens when we think? <laughs> we search scripture. We search him out, right? i got to figure out this. So we start Googling or reading the word or whatever. What does other people understand? I do that. One time I was so desperate, I wrote how I felt on Google. <laughs> Is there anyone doing the will of God? And when you do, the opposite happened in your life. Google. And yes, the answer came <laughs> for some preacher in the U.S. I was like, yes. <laughs> I was so desperate, right? But God answered me. I was so encouraged because I did not understand. And later, that is so, that's another weird thing. And then later, I could never find that article again. It was just lost. I was like, that's weird, Lord. You know, God. But God responded to me. I was really desperate. I didn't know how to look, even look in the Bible. I was like, yeah, I do this, and you tell me to do this, and you tell me to do that, and just get worse and worse and worse and worse. I was angry, upset, hurt. 
I was pissed off. I really was. I wanted to kill someone, you know. I was angry, you know. So I Googled, and the answer came. And then I'm like, okay, I'm not far off. I'm not off track. Right? So Jesus should always make us think. And even in my glorious experiences with the Lord, it always, how do I, I don't even understand. You can make me experience this? I don't understand, Lord. How is that possible? It always makes me think. Right? Because when we think, we think about Him. We contemplate Him. There is so much of Jesus that we, even though if we really get a lot here, it's just going to be like, you could hardly see it, you know, because he's, there's so much. And he wants to show, constantly show his love for us, right? Constantly pour out himself to us, right? So that we will get as much as possible while being here on earth, because that has a direct influence in heaven. All out of what? His love, the great passion. Was it helpful? Was it good? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. And in the remembrance of his great passion for us, <clears throat> let's have communion. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. God, I ask that you will <clears throat> bless this bread and this drink, Lord, that each of us are holding, Lord. And in remembrance of every word spoken here, Lord, that it, it shows and constantly proves your great passion for us, that you gave yourself away so that we may partake of what it is that you gave. You may eat the bread. Thank you, Lord, for <clears throat> leading a sinful, um, sinless life, Lord, enabling us and strengthening us to do the right things in all circumstances, Lord, that you place before us. Through the shedding of your precious blood, Lord, all because you led a sinless life. And by that you can take all sin upon yourself. All sin, each personal sin for us, Lord. Wow, that is so amazing, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Lord. You may drink. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Sakananda la bashi ki nindi de bo sukunanda de bo. Thank you, Jesus. Shakara la bashi sukunanda de bo.
مغز لوکه ما نکرده رو باز سکنم در باز شکنم در باز 